OK, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, sorry for the delay for those who are online. Uh, we'll have now two hands-on sessions uh, about scientific data visualizations with Maki.jl. The first one about plots, animations, and graphics. And the second one about visualizing Earth observation data with Tyler.jl. Uh, these these hands-on sessions will be uh, carried out by Sam Simon Danish. And Simon is the author of Maki and currently works full-time on Maki as a freelancer. He has been part of the Julia community for more than 10 years and is the author of many, many Julia packages. To just name a few that, that are still actively used by many people in the Julia community. Maki, Geometry Basics, GPU Arrays, Package Compiler, JSS Surf, and File.io. His mission has always been to create a sustainable plotting and graphics ecosystems for Julia, which enables visualizations in need of high performance as well as making it very easy to quickly create simple plots and integrate them into dashboards. Nowadays, with climate change threatening to destroy the fundamentals of our modern life, he is focusing his efforts on making sure that Maki works well for climate science to better understand the changes that are coming to us. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess I can skip the about me part. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that I'm part uh, maintainer of Tyler and Geomarchy, but um, I'm not that much into the geospace myself. It's just because I want to keep the ecosystem alive, but I don't actually um, work that much uh, with it because I'm really have a lot to do to keep Marky working. Um, about the workshop, I'll start with a basic introduction to Marky um, and tell you a few uh, of the basic concepts. And after that, I will talk a bit about plotting geodata. But I, I have to say that I'm not the specialist for geodata plotting, um, because yeah. <laughs> Um, my main job is actually the graphics inside Marky and make that work in a fast way on the GPU and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, mm -hmm. I will also um, show you how to build apps uh, with Bonito. I just recently finally renamed that. Um, so it was formerly named JS Surf. Um, I presented that at last Julia EO. Um, it's for making dashboards with Marky on, uh, in the web. Um, and I try to reference um, a lot of the documentations everywhere in, the, in this uh, workshop. So you can read through it later on and have a lot of starting points where to look for things. Um, now first, uh, what is Marky? Um, it's a modern plotting library for Julia. Um, it's modern because it runs fast on the GPU, uses a modern programming language that's easy to use. And of course, we try to also make Marky easy to use in a high level language. Um, I really um, try to have a large scope for Marky so that you can use it for almost any problem which has the advantage that you can use it for most things, but of course it's not as polished in some areas um, as a specialized tool for it. Um, but I think for a plotting library, this is especially um, powerful because you really just want to have one tool and do all your visualizations needs with that because it's really hard to learn a whole plotting library and switch it all the time. Um, Maki by now has a really rich ecosystem. Um, just want to quickly scroll through the new Maki webpage. Um, I think it's a good resource for everyone to, to have an overview, like what, what's it uh, doing, um, how, how it works, and um, yeah, get an impression what you can do with it. And I also reference quite a few of the um, Marky plugins or um, packages that build up on Marky. Um, you already heard there's Tyler, which I will be presenting a bit. And yes. 
Um, but I think you can already see here that there's a quite a, uh, a lot of different um, use cases you can ma use Marky for. Um, and this is mostly um, enabled by having different backends for different special purposes. Um, so all the plotting code, like how um, how to get from a heat map to like um, uh, apply transformations to it and stuff like that, all of this is defined in Marky.jl, but how to actually draw this on the screen is defined by the backends. Um, so you can have really fast GPU accelerated drawing um, of plots, but also can export it to a vector graphics for papers and stuff like that. And that's enabled by backends. And I will quickly uh, give a short overview about the backends because that's the first question, like which backend should I use for my project? And um, yeah, the first backend uh, I've written which actually goes way back before I even um, uh, wrote Marky, because I reused a lot of the code from even older libraries. <laughs> it was first called GL Visualize, and before that it was called GL Plot. And then I thought maybe I need a new package where I have different backends, because not everyone has a GPU. Um, you probably want to use it on the web with a completely different infrastructure. But this is also why it's the most uh, feature complete and the most polished backend. Um, it's really fast. And you even have uh, basic UI elements like buttons, sliders, and things like that. But yeah, it needs a GPU. It doesn't run everywhere. Um, but on uh, Linux, for example, it's relatively easy to set up a virtual GPU on a server, for example. Uh, the next backend um, that we developed um, uses Cairo under the hood. It has a really amazing 2D rendering quality, can export SVGs and PDFs um, for papers. It has a bit of uh, 3D support, um, but um, it's still experimental. So you can do surface plots with it and stuff like that, but sometimes it won't look as nice as in GeoMarkey. It's not interactive, so you really just render out SVGs or PNGs, um, but you can still loop over these uh, steps and make a movie out of it and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And it runs on the CPU, so it basically runs er anywhere without any problems. Uh, WebGL Marquee is uh, the next backend um, that I started developing like four or five years ago. It, is there to um, export market plots basically to the uh, browser, use it in notebooks like here. Um, you can also, uh, it also enables to uh, view it in, in VS Code in the plot pane because that's actually uh, using Electron under the hood. Um, it is also pretty fast because it uses the browser um, OpenGL implementation but it has quite a bit of overhead to actually transfer the data from Julia to the browser. Um, it's pretty feature complete, but some basic things are missing, like um, it doesn't have really nice line rendering like GeoMarkey, so you may run into like lines that look a bit uh, rugged. And, but yeah, it runs on websites, notebooks, and remote machines. And that's a little dashboard um, that, that runs on a website. So you can do stuff like that. And the, the nice thing about this is you can use any HTML um, or JavaScript to build um, UI elements for it to do interactive dashboards. And then finally, the newest uh, backend um, is the Radeon Pro render backend. Um, it uses ray tracing and makes really beautiful images, but I didn't really have a lot of time to polish it yet, so still has quite a few bugs. But Lazaro is using it already a lot um, to create beautiful images. Um, also for his website, Beautiful Maki, um, which I've linked in the notebook. 
Um, it's really slow because it really simulates the light uh, photorealistically. So you need high-end hardware to, to make animations. Now, um, this is a notebook with which you can um, also run uh, locally. Um, I usually prefer to just concentrate on the presentation and then run it at home or try it out because you may run into problems and it always slows down to just go around and set everyone up. So I don't really expect you to follow it, um, but if you have it running, um, it's um, relatively easy to set up. You, you, I also have a little description to um, how to add Julia because I'm using 1.10, which is a lot faster for pre-compilation. So if you've struggled with slow compile times uh, during the workshop, um, I would uh, recommend to upgrade to 1.10. Uh, especially for Marky, I think it's almost double as fast um, to, to compile things and start things. And yeah, then you just add iJulia and um, start JupyterLab in the folder where you downloaded the, the notebook and then you're in this screen. Um, the first thing you will do is um, activate the project I shipped, um, which already has all the packages that I uh, want to present here and work with. And some of them have just a very small role, so we are not talking about all of them here <laughs> in detail. And for this workshop, I'm using WebGL Marky because it works in the notebook and the browser. I don't usually work a lot in notebooks, so I found a few issues while preparing the workshop. One really annoying one, if you define a heading which is called Bonito, Jupyter somehow creates a global JavaScript variable that overrides the package. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I found that out yesterday because my notebook wasn't working anymore, the plots weren't showing up, and it's because I added a head, headline with Bonito. <laughs> so don't add headlines, uh, or a title, I mean, uh, with Bonito. <laughs> uh, so that's really crazy. Um, WebGL Marky also seems to be a bit slower in Jupyter which is also surprising because it uses exactly the same technology stack than in, in VS Code, for example. Or one other way to uh, show WebGL Marky plots is um, uh, directly in the browser. So they will show up here in a new tab. Um, and it's actually, a, quite a bit faster than in iJuya um, in JupyterLab. I still need to look into that. But um, yes, uh, just a few warnings. Um, but then we, um, when using a backend in Marky, it will activate it as the default backend. And you can switch between them by uh, just calling the backend and then activate. Wow. <laughs> so I, we'll be activating um, WebGL Marky, and there are also documentations for this activate function because you can actually pass configuration options to the activate call. For WebGL Marky, it's not that much. Um, it's basically just the frame rate at which it renders, and that you can actually set it to resize to like an HTML element, which is specific to WebGL Marky. Um, if you look at the documentation for GeoMarky, it will be a lot more because it has actually quite a few um, configuration options. But um, yeah, I'm, I won't go into detail for this workshop. Um, okay, let's start with the very basics of uh, creating a plot in, in Marky. So the main, uh, most top level um, object in Marky is the figure. It holds um, the layouting, um, it holds any axis you put in there, 
and uh, blocks and scenes. Um, I will talk a bit about blocks, but it's the, um, the super type of all things like a legend, a button, a widget, and an axis. Um, so that's the general term, basically. I won't talk much about scenes, but uh, because sometimes you might run into it, I'm mentioning it here. It's the most uh, low-level building block that you won't run into usually. It's, you can imagine it like the native drawing canvas for, for Marquee. But it, it, is really, uh, it can be really powerful because you can just draw anything into it and switch from a plotting library basically to a more drawing library. Um, but yes, this is how you um, create your first axis. Um, you just index into the figure at the position um, um, you want to have the plot in. So I'm creating an axis in position 1, 1 and 1, 2. So you have uh, two axes uh, next to each other. Oops. Um, and adding a new axis is uh, then pretty easy. You can just put it next to it or under it. Um, you can see that you can just pass uh, a lot of attributes to the axis to customize it, like titles and labels and stuff like that. Um, for the figure, um, the main um, parameter is the size and the background color. And the rest of the arguments uh, will become a theme um, for, for Marky to use. I will explain that a bit later. But before that, I want to show you how you can actually figure out how to tweak your axis. So there's a, a doc string um, which you can access like this. Uh, in the REPL, it's also just typing the question mark. Um, and I think uh, in, in VS Code, you can just hover over it and things like that, or, or call, uh, go to the REPL. Um, but that shows you basically um, all of the um, attributes you have for access. And then you can um, zoom in on it, like you're interested in, for example, like what can you do with titles in an axis? And then you can do this um, axis.title thing and get more documentation um, for this specific attribute. So here you can see um, that you can use latex strings um, for a title, and there's also this rich text uh, we added to Marky where you can basically do pretty uh, complicated um, text layouting with coloring parts of the text. And one of my next projects is to make this interactive, this help, so that you have a little pop-up where it actually shows the resulting plot of this example, but right now you would need to copy and paste it and run it, um, this example, and then you can see here three axes, one with a normal title, one with a latex title, and one with a rich text title. Um, yes. I already uh, mentioned theming for a little bit. I, I think it's almost an advanced topic, but I want to set a little theme for this workshop. So uh, I, I should mention it in the beginning. It's really just uh, any dictionary-like um, where you set some defaults for any attribute in a plot. So for example, for this figure we had here above with um, the background color, you can just um, set that here um, accordingly in the, uh, in the theme. You can globally set a size at which each figure is created. And you could, for example, for any scatter plot, um, you could also uh, set the marker size. And for any block, um, so axis, legend, etc., you can um, basically do a sub um, theme where you um, just add the attributes that you would usually pass to the axis directly. And the same goes for plot types. So you can. Um, just have a sub theme here to always make line plots of uh, width four. And there are several uh, different ways of setting that. So there's a, a set theme function that sets it globally. So any plot 
um, will have this theme applied that you create. Um, you can also do it in this do while block. So only um, plots created in this do while block, uh, do, do block um, will get the theme applied and after that um, you will have the default theme. And you can actually pass uh, these theme attributes to the figure directly and then only this figure will have this theme. Um, when I execute this here, I will be setting this globally, this theme. So the next plot I'm doing has this um, silver background color and always has a title with Marky Workshop. Um, by the way, you can always ask questions if I'm <laughs> too fast or anything is uh, not comprehensible. Um, yes. Um, you mean like this? Uh, you do actually, you can actually do that. Um, then it um, shows up without position, and then you can actually assign it to a position. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I will be discussing like a few shorthands later on mm -hmm. and I think the shorthands already Over. cover this in a way. I mean, it's different, but mm -hmm. I mean, your, your idea is to have less, to write less, right? Yeah, so, I, so I think that's... Yeah, yeah, I will show that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, if you have a... Um, axis, then you can plot into that axis and it will use that coordinate system and the transformation of an axis, etc. Um, and it's always uh, the version with a bang um, of the plotting function because you actually mutate the axis, you add a new plot to it. Um, there are a couple of shorthands. <laughs> to create this um, in, in one a line, basically. So the, the plotting function without the bang can uh, create this whole thing at once. So you can actually um, create this whole plot with an axis and a figure um, in one line. And then you have these attributes here that you can pass to the plotting function where you just pass the attributes of a figure or axis um, to customize it. So here you could say um, my title to actually create, um, change the axis. Um, there are a couple of these. Um, so you can directly plot um, into a figure position and it will create a new axis for you. Um, we had this one already where you plot into an axis and then just for completeness, you can also directly plot into a scene. Um, but it's pretty low level and I don't think, uh, yeah, you will um, see this unless you have more advanced use cases. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is how to uh, color your plots. Um, there are quite a few different ways um, how to uh, pass colors. So the first one is you just color the whole plot with one color. Um, so you pass one color to the color attribute in the plot. Um, it supports quite a few different ways of defining the color. So you can use like these um, CSS um, names for colors, which are parsed and converted to a color. You can directly um, call like this RGB type, which creates a color in a more low level way. 
and I have a few pointers where you can actually get those names from. So um, the colors.jl documentation has a really nice page um, to get like these color names. So for example, here is light cyan and you can then uh, immediately use that in Marquee. Um, and you can also use, not just use RGB, but um, Marquee supports all color types from the colors.jl package. Oh wow, <laughs> which is uh, quite a lot. Um, so all of the main color spaces, I think, that I uh, in use, so H HSL and stuff like that. Um, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I usually specify 20 colors and I only ask for like the middle 10 or the middle 15. Is it possible to do that? Yes, so you can use, um, Maki has this conversion infrastructure to go like from strings to actual colors and you can uh, hook into that. There's this to color map function um, which generates the actual array of colors from a color map name. Um, and then you can do like three, two, something like that. And then you can actually uh, use that. Um, and yeah. Oh, this is a big too big. <laughs> But yeah, the next thing you can do is like have one color per primitive in the plot. So in a scatter, scatter plot, uh, that's one per point. In a, a line plot, it's one per um, um, line point. So you can also have like um, a smooth interpolation there. Um, yeah, and then we already started talking about color maps. Um, you just give the color argument the numbers you want to get mapped to a color, and then you give the color map um, argument with the actual um, color map that you want to use. But you could also give it an array of colors. And the array of colors, again, supports all of colors.jl, color types, and all of these um, CSS color names. Um, yes, and the Color map also has like a few more attributes. You can give a color range to like cut it. And then you can give it a color if you're under the color range in your numbers and um, in above, which is like the low clip and high clip one. You can give NAN colors, uh, NAN numbers in the colors, a specific color. And then if you look at that, um, so we have low clip red. I have a range for the colors um, from 1 to 10. So the first two will be red. Then it will be the color map. Then I added a few NANs to the color so, and uh, made them orange. So you have two orange colors here. Then still uh, values from the color map. And finally, you have the um, high clip in black, which is above the color range. And here I also uh, show you how you can interact with the axis. So any attribute in the axis you can just set interactively. Sam, another question, because you said there were none colors, any end colors, is there also colors for missing data? No, uh, so Maki actually doesn't support, oh no, it does support missing. It will convert to NAN and then NAN color should apply. Um, yes. So um, here I show how you can uh, mutate the axis to give it different um, Y ticks. So here I have um, these labels I gave to the plots as the ticks. 
uh, for the y-axis. So here's the simple CSS color, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yes, Maki also has pretty elaborate color docs um, and cheat sheets and stuff like that. So if you want, if you're lost uh, in uh, how to give your um, plot nice colors, Marky has a, a quite a bit of um, documentations about what you can use. And I usually visit this website um, to fi find a nice gradient to use because you can see it here uh, nicely laid out. Um, and there's also um, a dictionary of all the accepted color names um, that you can consult if you're not sure or if you want to like uh, pick them. And similarly, there's uh, all gradient names, which is 2030 elements. <laughs> so you can choose from quite a lot of gradients and create your own. And yeah, I already showed that, that you can use all these different official color spaces. If you're, I think this is especially interesting if, if you have data in that color space from I don't know, from a satellite, for example, if it comes in a certain color space. Um, Marky will understand that. And of course, if you're talking about uh, colors um, for plots, I think the next important thing is how to actually create legends to map um, the plots uh, to some more description. And uh, one very simple thing you can do is call this access legend function on the axis. It will search for any plot inside the axis with a label. So that's why there are all these labels in here. Um, and then it will create a legend for that. Um, you can place this pretty uh, freely, it's also shown in the access legend doc string. Um, but you can also create the legend manually in a certain position in the layout. So here I do the same by placing the legend next to the plot. And I'm also hiding the Y labels because now we don't need uh, these labels there because they're redundant. Um, that's just a convenient function to set like um, x dot uh, tick labels visible equals false um, and then x ticks um, equals false and so on. And Maki has a few of these, um, a few of these shorthands which you can also find in the access docs. So I think I don't have enough time to go all, all of, over this, but there's a lot you can learn in the docs about interactions with the axis, like how, how you zoom, how you register new interactions with the axis, um, how to set aspect ratios, and what all these um, parameters mean. Um, yeah, the legends are also very flexible. I won't go much into detail here as well. But as you can see in the link docs already, like you can basically create any legend with any layout um, you want. And you can even have custom markers and stuff like that. So I'm pretty confident that, that you will be able to create any legend you want with this. Um, color bar works quite similarly as you already can see here um, for the examples that actually use a color map or multiple colors it falls back to just black because you can't just represent a whole color map into one point and that's where you uh, likely will want to create a color bar instead um, I just uh, quickly made an example here that um, shows this uh, for the example which set the low clip and high clip. And you can also see this in the color bar here. That's the low clip and high clip color. Um, I already show here a bit 
that you're pretty free to place this legend with the marquee layouting system. So you can actually put any block object into the same position as another um, axis, for example, and then you can um, position it with these additional arguments. Um, and that's how I made it like the axis here and placed it freely. And the default is um, pretty easy to create just by placing it next to the plot. Um, again, this like how to really fine tune this is a more advanced topic, which is covered uh, nicely by the docs. So here you can also see like you have a lot of different options to customize uh, these color bars with a lot of um, parameters. Um, because I already talked a lot about layouting, I just quickly want to mention a few resources for layouting because I think uh, Maki has one of the best layouting system out there, um, thanks to Julius, who wrote like a custom layouting solver to lie uh, because we couldn't really find anyone that was nice enough to align things to the spines and stuff like that. Um, so in the documentation, there's a full um, tutorial about how to do really complex layouts with Maki. Um, and we also, uh, at I think JuliaCon 22, um, we gave a pretty long workshop just about uh, layouting. So uh, if, if you have the need for really complex layouts, uh, that's where to find more. But I won't discuss all these little tricks here with tell width, tell height, and stuff like that in detail in this workshop. Um, yes. So finally, uh, we come to axes and blocks. So as I already said, like all axes are uh, blocks. Um, we have quite a few um, blocks, um, like UI elements, like button, interval slider, menu, slider grid, and so on. You, uh, they are also documented. So if you search in the docs for menu, you will see how to use it. And that's how you can create little menus. Um, I won't um, describe this more because I actually want to show you how to do this, this more complex um, UIs with Bonito uh, in the web because I think there is a large interest into actually having like a website with a dashboard uh, and these UI elements. Um, but yeah, you can also uh, see there are a few more access types. There's not just um, the one we have been seeing right now is the 2D axis, but there's also a 3D axis. Um, because I already loaded GeoMarkey before the workshop, there is now a geo axis in here. If you just load Marky itself, um, this wouldn't be in here. And we have a polar axis. And a little bit, this L scene is a, bit, a little bit an outlier. It's our way to uh, include a scene, uh, a 3D scene from the legacy Marky, basically, before Julius wrote all these crazy cool layouting things. Um, but just to get an idea about all these different axis types, um, ah, I think it needs to compile. Um, I made a little example to um, just show the most used axis type. Um, you can choose the um, axis type explicitly by passing the type. And of course, you can also just do like axis three, um, like we learned in the beginning. But yeah, I, I usually use the shortcut, <laughs> the shorthand. Um, okay, so, oh, that's a bit too big. So that's probably the most commonly used axis type. Um, the L scene doesn't have a very nice um, grid you see the, that the numbers are a little bit too small and things like that. We never got around to improve this a lot, but 
this um, L scene has a very fancy camera. Um, so it almost is like a computer game camera or an AutoCAD or 3D S Max camera. You, you have a lot of keyboard shortcuts to actually move around with it. So I'm, I'm using uh, WASD to just move around here. Um, I think this is not very well documented because it's kind of uh, not a lot of people know that this Elsin has this complex 3D camera, um, but it's documented. You can actually um, um, customize it a lot with like what keyboard buttons to press and stuff like that. You have stuff like tilting the plot um, and rotating and zooming it. So this is the most advanced one. If you have a really th complex 3D scene, that's probably what you want to use. The Axis 3 um, is more like the Axis, um, the default Axis, in the sense that it actually um, squishes your data to fit into the plotting window. Um, so it's really nice for making um, visualizations for a paper. And um, you see it has a smart um, algorithm to lay out the ticks, etc. So this is, I think, a lot more similar to what you use from uh, MATLAB or matplotlib for 3D axis, but you can't zoom into this one. So because it tries to fit the whole plot um, into the window, you won't be able to zoom. You can only zoom over the limits, I think. And this is. Um, Frederick um, added this and put a lot of work into making this nice. Um, yeah, that's how you can plot in polar coordinate system. Now, um, I've mentioned like a few plot types already, um, I think because they're very common, but um, didn't talk much about them. So they all also have like a doc string that you can query with the question mark. Um, you, you can also see like that there are these two versions, lines and lines uh, with a bang. You have some basic um, arguments that you can use. So you can use an array of points. Um, you can use an array of X and Y. And if you go 3D, um, you can add the Z component. And I think this is actually a weakness of the Marquee documentation right now that this only has like these three um, descriptions here because there are a lot of conversions um, that you can actually use, but we don't have a nice infrastructure to list them all um, because they're defined in function overloads. So for example, there's also stuff like circle, Um, that it just that you can just use any geometry type and it tries to throw, uh, draw a line around it. And um, this is not that well documented yet. Um, I will concentrate on this, I, I hope, later this month. And right now, the, <laughs> the best I can give you um, is that try it out because a lot of it actually works, like a lot of types. So we defined a lot of conversions. And there are also a lot of um, plotting methods. So with base uh, Marky, it's already 57. Um, so I, I think it covers um, most of the plotting functions you're used to from other plotting libraries. There is also in the documentation, in the reference section, you have an overview of all the plot types. So if you're ever lost, just scroll through this and uh, find your plot. Sometimes um, they have a bit different names from the plotting library you used to, but usually we try to stick to what MATLAB or MATPLOTLIB does uh, with the naming. Um, 
I got out a few um, plotting types that I think are relevant for um, visualizing Earth data. So for example, to have this topology data of this uh, volcano, you might want to use contour F and Yes, it also has these features to uh, filter out like lower and higher uh, topologies and then create this nice um, plot here. Um, another one um, that I singled out here is a surface plot, um, which is also, I think, very relevant for um, visualizing terrain data. So um, here you can see the same volcano as an actual surface plot. And I, I want to use this chance to show you quickly how to actually animate and update um, plotting types in Marky. So you can actually just um, mutate the same argument names that you used before. So to change the color map, you can pretty much just uh, do this and then the uh, color map will update interactively. You can also um, update the arguments that you gave to the plot. So in the first, it always um, corresponds to the argument that you passed. So if you pass just one argument with the data, you will index into the plot with one and then you can actually update the data. And you will see that I now added a bit of noise to this and it will update immediately. Um, yeah, this updating is a bit slower in WebGL Marky than in GL Marky, but it's still pretty fast, I think. Um, also, like this, if you think this stutters a bit, this X3, I, I'm pretty happy with the performance because all of the layouting and everything like this is done in Julia and then send to the browser. So if you rotate here a bit, um, it will do uh, thousands of calculations in Julia and send a lot of data back to update the plot. Um, which is kind of impressive, I think, that, that we got the performance to do this. Um, but I think in the future we want to move more things to JavaScript so you don't need to round trip for, for just turning around your plot. Um, yeah, the L scene actually already has a, a little uh, JS camera, so that one will update more quickly. Um, since uh, I, I added this example yesterday because I talked with quite a few people that didn't know that this works. Um, so Maki also has support for irregular um, surfaces. So you can give it a matrix of X and Y coordinates and then a Z, um, the Z one. And you can also give it a completely new color so that it's not um, colored by looking up the Z values and mapping that to a color map, but you can give it a completely new um, color. And that's how you can map, um, for example, the Marky logo on a surface plot, which <laughs> it's more like a gimmick. Um, and you can also set the Z um, to an array of um, zeros, for example, to make a flat 2D surface plot with irregular grids. I think a lot of people will use that in um, um, showing like Earth data that is like skewed or distorted um, or satellite data. So, so would that be the fastest uh, building function plot this rotating <coughs> Uh, which one? The surface one you just presented. So if, if I want to plot a rotated grid or a grid that's stretched, rotated in 2D, that surface would be difficult <coughs> to do it with mapping or speed mapping? Um, so a surface has a bit of overhead compared to like image if it's 2D. Yeah. And if you only rotate the whole image, yeah. image will be a lot faster. But if you uh, need to like apply a transformation to every point, like with a projection, for example, then you can't get around surface and paying the overhead of actually, yeah, uh, multiplying every point by a transformation. So, so if you 
you have a transformation point by point surface in the choice, and if you have just a rotation, the image supports the. Yeah, it supports rotate, translate, oh, also okay. not there. Um, Simon, yeah. can uh, color also be Z? To, uh, uh, that's the default. Okay. Um, so in the default, if you don't set it, um, color will be equals to Z. So, so here you see like zero it, and color equals to Z, then it would be uh, some something like a heat map, right? Yeah, yeah, will be pretty much a heat map. Um, uh, why? I actually wanted to quickly use this chance to show a little difference between Marky and WebGL Marky. Um, so Marky, um, GL Marky has a, a lot better um, transparency than um, WebGL Marky. We didn't have the time to show this yet. I, I, mind, I mean, to improve this yet in, in WebGL Marky, but here you see um, that's a real transparency um, there. If you use WebGL Marky with the transparency true argument, you will see that it looks a bit weird. <laughs> Um, and I don't know why it's so slow, to be honest. It's, it's only the surface thing. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, anyways, the next um, plot type I wanted to present is um, pretty new. It's a data shader um, implementation. Um, it enables you to um, visualize billions of points um, at interactive speeds. And it works by aggregating all the points into an image, and then you can basically just view the image. And it recalculates the image um, every time you zoom in, so then you get a better resolution. Um, this is still doing stuff. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I wanted to quickly show this with the um, New York Taxi data set, with, which has like 14 million points, which is already quite a lot um, for most plotting libraries. Hmm. I think I might have confuse it by actually wanting to show it in a window. Mm. Huh. There we go. Yeah, now it works again. And as you can see, this looks really weird because it shows um, the things not with real transparency. <laughs> so sometimes like the front is in front of the back and stuff like that. But if you remove the transparency, true, it at least um, doesn't do this weird front and back thing. Okay. So uh, for anyone who's, who's actually following this in the notebook, I didn't ship the data set. Um, I have it already downloaded locally because you can just download it with downloads.jl. Um, so I won't need to download it, but it's like 500 megabytes. So I didn't really want anyone to download that much of data here on the Wi-Fi. Um, but here you can see how to download, um, load it very quickly. We want to just um, visualize the drop-off latitude and longitude, which is like, as I said, 40 million points. And just to give you an idea of how bad it is to actually visualize um, 40 million points just with a normal scatter, I quickly show you this. I do it in GLMarky because I think um, 
WebGL Maki will have a bit more trouble with 14 million points. Um, this is, I think, here. This data set has a few outliners, outliers. But that's, I think, most of the points are actually here. And as you can see already, I gave it a bit of transparency to give an idea of the density, but it's just a big black blob, <laughs> and you don't see that much. Um, if you zoom in more and more, you can start seeing a structure here. And I think it's pretty cool that GL Marky is able to just visualize 40 million points, but yeah, it won't be, uh, yeah, it won't look that informative in the end. Um, so that's where data shader comes in. And that's one of the examples where it's really noticeable how like outside Jupiter, it's actually pretty fast. <laughs> And uh, inside Jupiter, somehow, it's a lot slower. Um, I don't know, that was unexpected. Because I actually tried data shader out with WebGL Marky a lot when I uh, implemented it. But um, as you can see, like zooming, oh, that's not too bad. But then it has all these updates that kind of come in, so. <laughs> With WebGL Marky, I would just use the zoom rect plot. Wow, okay, never mind. It is bad. Um, to get an idea how it is with GL Marky, um, it's a lot faster. So you can just zoom around and it works pretty well. Um, Yes. Um, this is a very new um, recipe, so we are still trying to polish it a bit. Um, but yeah, that's a really nice way to um, visualize very big data sets. And this slowly transitions to how to actually add um, geodata plots on top of it. Um, for example, you might want to actually have an overlay of uh, New York on top of it. Um, I'm using GeoJSON to actually lo load a, um, a feature collection um, of those states uh, in New York. And you actually need to load GeoMarkey to plot them. Like I said, Marky defines all these um, argument conversions for plots. And this feature collection from GeoJSON and base Marky, you won't be able to plot it. It will just say, like, can't convert the argument. But if you load GeoMarky, it will actually um, define those conversions for feature collection. And then you can actually um, display it. So in which backend am I? Yeah, I'm still in GeoMarky, that's probably good. And then you can, um, if they're in the same projection, you can quite easily just uh, lay it over by plotting into the same axis um, the geo object. And then you have it nicely overlaid. Of course this, <laughs> won't work as well if you have, are in different projections for the data, or actually want to apply different conversions. Um, which brings us to Tyler, which operates in a different um, um, projection space because it actually um, translates these tiles into this um, tile projection space. Um, but it's a Nice Marky extension to um, view map and satellite data from um, these tile providers. Just to give you an idea, there are quite a lot of um, tile providers here um, that you can choose from. So OpenStreetMap is a very famous one. I think there's also NASA on there. Some are, uh, I think, then actually need a um, key because they're um, you need to log in and have a key 
for them to serve your data. But um, yeah, what Tyler will do, it will download from the servers um, the map tiles and then actually display them in Marquee. Um, and then you basically get Google Maps and Tyler. Um, we created this package last year at Julia EO and Raphael put quite a bit of work into this. Um, I pretty much was just uh, responsible for like making Marky um, work with this. Um, and Martijn, I think, uh, helped with the projection, um, projection spaces, um, which uses map tiles um, to project from the um, from Web Mercato to VGS84, uh, and that's the default projection with Tyler. Um, but yeah, you can also change the provider to example to the NASA GIPS um, provider, and for example, see the satellite image for the Earth at night, and get this one. So now if you want to plot into this, it's a bit more complicated because of these projections. And what you can do in Marquee is you can define for any plot type, you can define your own custom projection and transformation. Um, what I did here is basically just copy and paste the projection from Tyler that it applies internally onto these tiles put them into a project function and wrap them here in these marquee specific structs. So this is the uh, point transformation type, which means the function expect as an input one single point. It's a 2D point, which you can also specify, and that's just for marquee internally to do the right thing. Um, and then you put it into this transformation struct, which also um, does the translation and rotation of plots. So you can actually call like rotate on this transformation with a degree, for example, um, to rotate a plot like this. This also works like with uh, plot objects, which pretty much just forwards um, these function to um, the transformation that each plot has. And Obviously, you can also give it this uh, transformation um, function that gets applied to any point in the plot. And that's how you can actually use any marquee plotting type. Ah, I need to execute this. And then get them uh, correctly transformed and laid over the plot. Um, I will delete this um, plot for now from the axis because it just overlays over everything. And quickly show how you can, for example, um, overlay the Italian states, uh, which yeah, then looks like this. And you can zoom into this. Works a bit better than data shader, but it's also still a bit slower than the GLMarky version or even the WebGL Marky version in a new tab. <laughs> so I don't know what, if this is my fault that Jupyter is slower or if Jupyter does something weird, like with overwriting my library <laughs> again or something like that. Um, yes. And of course, um, this um, updating of the plot types also works. Um, that's universal to any Marky plot. So if you have any Marky library that defines any extension and it returns your Marky plot, you can always just update them um, by um, mutating the plot type. Um, now, GeoMarky defines um, another um, access type, which is the GeoAxis, and that's a, basically just a convenience for doing these projections and creating better ticks for them. Um, it tries to create decent ticks for any projection that it supports, and which is a lot. Um, uh, I think, wait, in the GeoMarky docs, 
uh, which aren't very complete. It shows most of the projections it supports, um, which come from geodesity, I think. So I, I think it supports all common projections, but that makes it kind of hard to do uh, the ticks and labels in any um, weird projection. Uh, we worked quite a bit on this at uh, Markicon, and I worked a little bit on this before coming here, but it's still not perfect. But now it kind of works that you have like create this geo axis just like any other Marky axis with the addition that you can add a destination projection and a source projection for the, for the plot uh, that you, um, for the data that you plot into it. Um, so that's how you can get this kind of axis. And with any uh, plot type, you can actually also pass the source um, projection. Um, so you can, into the same geo axis, you can um, plot different data sources into it. Um, so this is just the fallback, pretty much, uh, if you don't supply this keyword. Um, and as I already said, I'm, I'm not the expert with these projections. <laughs> Um, I'm, I basically learned about all of this at last year EO, and not that much has happened since then. Um, yeah, so I think others are well more um, fluent in this. But I, I, I wanted to create, um, show you a small interactive visualization using GeoMarkey, which um, uh, Lazaro pointed me to, and that uses YAX arrays, which is a pretty cool um, Julia package to um, work with really large data sets. So you can give it an online source, and this one I think is 64 gigabytes uh, large, and then you can open this data set, but you don't need to download the whole 64 gigabytes, but you can just query like subsets of it pretty much, and I already executed this um, because it can take a while depending on the Wi-Fi. Uh, when it was good, I think it only took like five seconds, so that's not too bad. Um, it's, um, I think, surface temperatures. Um, I did link the source of this somewhere. <laughs> Maybe it got over, but um, it's in the YAX array documentation. And then you can um, look up the longitude and latitude in this data set that um, these data points are from and get the actual um, measurements from it. To visualize it, we had to shift it to go from minus 180 to 180. And then we can actually um, create this visualization. I'm um, introducing a new concept here that is very basic to um, Bonito and Marky. It's the observable. It's pretty much like just a small wrapper around any data, which you can up update and register um, listeners on it. So whenever the data updates, you can call a function, um, or you can map it to a new one, um, which I will explain a bit later. So how do we do it? You can always pass an observable to any Marky um, attribute. And here we have the slice of the data, so the time pretty much. We want to be able to pass the projection and the color map. Um, that's this mapping, so whenever the slice observable gets a new number, it will call this function here, look up the index in the data, and then you get the slice data here as a new observable. So if we execute this, um, we, we can see this um, data set over the geo axis. I added like a um, 
plot for the coastlines. And here you can also see this translate feature because you, need to, you want to put it uh, above the surface plot, the lines, because otherwise they wouldn't be visible. So you can just translate, rotate, or scale any plot like this. And then to update these observables, um, you can just uh, use the indexing notation. And this here means um, yeah, changing the slice index to 10 and using a new column map. And then it will immediately update uh, in a pretty efficient way. Um, there are quite a few um, documentations for how to use observables. I think it's uh, somehow one of the more advanced topics in Marky. Um, a lot of people are used to just specify each frame, basically, and then make a new plot. Um, but with these observables, we can just, for a whole big plot, we can change, for example, with the 40 million points, you would have this huge plot. And if you have like an observable that just changes the color, it will not redraw anything else but the color. So you can do very fast updates with it, um, which is the advantage. I think the disadvantage is that it's a bit harder to use. But yeah, we have quite a bit of um, documentation for it um, in the market documentation. Uh, observables uh, is an external package that Marky uses, which has also um, quite a bit of uh, documentation how to use it. And we have some more general one, how to make animations and um, how to actually make um, interactions uh, with Bonito as well, because Bonito also uses observables. But um, now we have this nice little function um, where you can pass attributes to it that animate um, the whole plot, which I think calls for a dashboard. Um, so I will quickly walk you through how to create a dashboard um, from this with, um, with Bonito. Uh, I don't know, how much time do I have left? Is it um, more than half an hour, right? Good. So um, yeah. Last year it was called um, JS Surf. It was a really bad name. I came with that. Uh, I came up with that in I think 2018, and I thought, okay, this won't be used uh, in, in like a user facing. So I just gave it whatever name. But then it turned out that people want to make actually more advanced dashboards with it and use it to write HTML and JavaScript in Julia. So uh, I wanted to rename it for a long time to give it a bit a nicer name, which I finally done uh, three weeks ago. <laughs> um, so if you see JS Surf somewhere men still mentioned, um, I probably haven't updated all places of the whole ecosystem to mention now Bonito. But yeah, it's the workhouse I, behind WebGL Marky that I created um, back when I started working on the WebGL Marky backend because there was no good way in Julia to communicate with the browser and um, actually render HTML and things like that. And yeah, I put quite a bit of focus on uh, a performant communication with JavaScript. So it uses, um, it tries to compress uh, the data as much as possible and uses binary serialization to make them as small as possible, the, the messages that get sent from Julia to JavaScript, which allows quite a bit of um, speed. Um, the, also, the other um, thing I really wanted to have is that it can be rendered in any context so that you can easily um, define one app and then just put it in a notebook, put it on a website, or even put it into a static website, like into the, the documentation or, or things like that. Um, the Marky website is actually created with um, Bonito, um, which then uses the functionality to export static websites. Um, so it can be used for pretty complex projects. Um, the basic is um, this app block here, where you define uh, what you want to send uh, to the browser. It uses this um, DOM uh, module 
to access all kind of HTML tags. So um, I think if you try the autocomplete here, huh? Okay, Jupyter doesn't like this. <laughs> hmm. Well, anyways, um, th these are just the normal HTML tags you can get a lot of tutorials for. Um, it defines a few um, components, I would call them, that you can just call into that creates um, HTML and CSS, for example, to create a centered um, um, headline. And of course, it works well with WebGL marquee, so you can just, uh, into this DOM, into this HTML DOM, you can just put any marquee figure and it will turn up in there and will also be interactive, uh, just like you're used to it. Um, it also um, has a bit of infrastructure um, for styling the HTML because it's kind of cumbersome to write an external CSS file. It also works, you can include an external CSS file, so you can also use like existing CSS libraries like Tailwind. But I think if you want to create components, it's really important to have a simple way um, to style things. Um, it's really just mapping to CSS, but it of course has to use Julia syntax because you're creating it in Julia. Um, it makes it really easy to make reusable components because you can just do like button, um, and then give it like a custom style for your component. And the beauty here is for each app, um, Bonito will only uh, render out one style sheet. So if you include the same style a lot of times, it won't include it in the website a lot of times, which is very important for this to work. Um, you can also give it like um, this, these CSS hover, um, pseudo classes to, for example, uh, do something on a hover and change the style there. And I actually used chat GPT a lot um, with this because it's really good at just taking existing CSS and translating it to the Julia syntax. So for example, what I've done a lot here, oh, it's really small, is like, um, you need to kind of explain to chat GPT what the syntax is like, but something like this is enough. And then you can just say, please translate me this piece of CSS I found on the internet um, to um, the Bonito kind of syntax. And I also, um, then you can just tell it to like, please give me a style to make a button that turns red on hover. And it's actually pretty good at that. Um, so especially for me, I'm not a CSS expert or JavaScript expert. This has helped a lot to style things. Um, yeah, this is how you can actually then style the app. And as you can see, it has a different font. It has a font size here and turns red if you hover. Um, all of this is also explained in the doc strings of these components in Bonito, um, how to style it and how to actually work with it um, because you want to react on changes of these widgets. Um, I, yes, um, as you can already see here, um, this button widget has this value, which is an observable. So you can register a function on it, like every time the button changes, please call this function here. So, um, and the other widgets also uh, should have, um, also have this um, documentation so you can really make really um, really nicely styled um, 
apps with that. Um, and I just want to quickly show you how this works with observables. Um, this map function I already explained. So every time the slider changes here, you add a uh, plus one to it. And then in this new value, you have the slider value plus one. And that's, for example, how you can um, show this here. Um, Bonito supports putting observables anywhere, so into the DOM. So here I, I just put this new value directly into this um, grid. And then it will render inside the HTML and will update accordingly. Um, and print out a lot of text. <laughs> because I also showed you the on function. Oh, did I make a shortcut to run the whole notebook? <laughs> Sorry. Hmm. Okay. Um. Yeah, so um, Bonito has quite a few of these widgets, like the style of a slider, the button, it has a drop down, and quite a few more widgets, which you can see in the docs. Um, so you have a text field as well, number inputs, um, and this card thing, so you can nicely group things together, and have these stylable sliders, which you can put your own styling on. Um, and yeah, this is, shows all of them together in a layout. And it also has um, a lot of layouting primitives to create a very complex layouting. Um, I actually recently ported a very cool um, tutorial um, that explains how to do layouting in CSS. It's um, a very fancy layout uh, tutorial uh, that goes into depth to create really nice uh, layouts with very nice visualizations. I did a, a bit simpler version of it, um, but it's still interactive, so it shows you how to really do complex layouting and explains all the different concepts like how to align things and um, it was also really helpful for me because, yeah, I'm also just starting um, to learn CSS. But this interactive thing really helped me to be able to create these different layouts. Um, I think whoever wants to create a nice dashboard should really read through this tutorial. I'm not sure if it's relevant to everyone here, so. I'm just um, using this grid here, which is the main um, component to do these complex layouts. And, and have it as a given here to create this layout, for example, to make a slider, a button, and a drop down. Um, you do need to use uh, Bonito um, for the easiest um, way of making a dashboard. Um, we have been talking with uh, the Jenny developers to incorporate it, which is possible, but nobody has worked on it. <laughs> and I think, yeah, you could probably hack around it, but it's, yeah, it's not easy out of the box be a project for me, I guess, to make that work. Um, um, but you can actually 
Yeah, no, yeah, dash is an alternative, so dash.jl to Bonito. I think you could probably inline WebGL market plots in there, um, so you can actually do it. Yeah, but I haven't tried it yet. Um, yeah, but um, this also gives you most of the power of um, CSS and HTML to do these nice dashboards. Um, already had this. Oh, damn. The interrupt wasn't very good. <laughs> now um, that we have this basic here with the um, slider and the observables, oh, I just want to quickly show you how it works together with um, Marky because Bonito uses observables, Marky uses observables. It's then very easy to um, animate things um, with Bonito and Marky and it should be pretty efficient. Um, coming back to this um, Earth visualization, I think we now have everything in place to actually use those widgets to update the visualization of the Earth data. Um, it's a bit larger app because it uh, also creates this header and um, the widget grid. Um, I added some um, titles on top of it um, so that you oh I I think this is so much bigger because I tried to set um, the font size <laughs> oh no. Why did it reload? Um, yes, I don't know um, why I just reloaded the notebook, um, but um, now like this, you have these widgets which you can um, change the projection and the time of this animation. And finally, uh, I want to show you how you can actually deploy these apps. Um, on, into different contexts outside the notebook because, uh, yeah, the notebook use case is actually not the first class use case of Bonito. That's also, yeah, I'm not using it that often with the notebooks. Um, that's why all these things are happening. But um, in Bonito, you can create a server and then it shows you where it's hosted and running you can click on that link and you see that there's no root added yet and that's where you can add your app so if you already have like a bonito app you can add it to the um, most basic route for example oh, i have way too much open here and this way um, your app will end up here on this uh, localhost website and that's how you can pretty much ship it. And here you can also see that it's a lot faster than in Jupyter. It's basically instant, and in Jupyter it was lacking quite a bit. It also doesn't get the CSS overwritten by Jupyter. And um, works quite a bit better. Um, now, um, if you want to actually run this on your server, you most likely don't have users go on, onto a local host. Um, you will route it to your website, right? And that's where this uh, proxy URL comes into place, um, which you set to your um, website. 
And I actually made uh, some Bonito demos um, that I run on my own server. And I can just quickly show you how that will look like. Um, um, VS Code has this really nice uh, interface for SSHing into a server, uh, which I'm using a lot. So I can just open a new VS Code panel um, that runs on my server. And the Julia plugin also allows you to make this session, the Julia session, persistent. So when I close VS Code, uh, the server will still be running. And um, here, oh, it's probably way too, too small. Um, here you can see the code to set up server uh, as you've seen before. I have um, created a few apps here um, that I include in these files. And then you can add them to the server with this root um, function. And this actually runs in Germany. And now you can access it on this um, side. And It seems like, yeah, it works now. I think the internet is really slow. <laughs> Yesterday when I tried it was pretty much instant. On the right Wi-Fi. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but it still is pretty interactive even though it runs in Germany and now uh, needs to get here. Um, so you can just ship these kind of apps then on the website. And it's um, pretty interactive. So you can just add a new route interactively here. So if I just want to have like a new page, hello, for example, I can just give it a new app here. Probably better to have it a uh, And then you should be able to go here and see this new app. So that's how you can kind of develop your Bonito server and web page. Um, so yeah, the next thing you can do is like do the export, uh, the static export, which I've been using for the Marky website. Um, and that looks like this. Um, you will need this new type to create the roots and because you don't actually have a server to add the roots to. And then you can export them all into a, into a folder. And then any st server um, that serves like HTML files will be able to make a website out of this. So in, in GitHub, this will be just in the pages folder that you use. Live server, you can just um, give a folder and it will create your, uh, it will host it as a website. So I'm using live server here to then um, serve this and you see you have the app here as a static export. The big difference of course is for the static export, um, you only have HTML files and no Julia server anymore. So any interaction that was defined in Julia won't work anymore, um, which is of course a pity, but there are few workarounds to keep things still interactive. Um, like for example, um, the, the 3D camera for the L scene in Java uh, in Bonito uh, or WebGL Marky lets you still interact because it's actually written in JavaScript. So if you have a, like a 3D scene, it will be still interactive. And anything you actually wrote in JavaScript will stay interactive. So 
I did this little um, example here in the documentation, which does the updates in JavaScript and the calculations. So things like this stay interactive um, even without it um, running through your process. Um, and the WebGL market docs also have a few um, examples here where you can see what's possible to keep interactive on the static uh, documentation side. So for example, there's this uh, record state experimental feature that goes through all the widgets you have in the DOM and then pre-records all Julia values and that lets you still um, interact with this. But it creates pretty large files because it needs to cache all the combinations of states that are possible. So it doesn't work for all cases. Um, yes, any questions? Yes. Specific uh, motivation to make it like specific to Mac and be more performant. What, what's your main rationale for for it? Uh, so the main rationale um, is performance and uh, using observables, because I think a lot of the other frameworks are using diffing um, to update like the HTML and attributes, which always needs to traverse the whole tree and figure out what's different. Um, and with um, the observables, you can directly only update the attribute uh, that you're updating. And the protocol um, is pretty advanced. I don't know of many other libraries that actually use like the binary compression and stuff like that. So it's pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, and one big other thing um, is, is the components. Um, that you can actually in Julia create new um, widgets for Bonito. So I, I really hope that we'll create a rich um, ecosystem of um, stylable components. Um, if you look, um, at uh, Bonito, you, you can see that the, these components are actually uh, relatively simple. They just directly pass the attributes forward to CSS and um, HTML, and then anyone can use them and um, use them in the dashboards. And one of the big frameworks before Bonito in Julia was uh, WebIO, and that didn't allow you at all to do these component things because you always had to have the whole app. So if you wanted to style something or interact with something inside this component, you basically um, had to pass the whole thing in there and then it wouldn't be modularized anymore. It would be specific to the app that you wrote. And that's a big difference. Okay. Thank you. That's uh, what I wanted to show. And any discussion? Thank you.